Christ. Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, from his Son and our Savior Jesus, and from the Holy Spirit who proceeds from God and lives in us. The Word of God that I want to study with you today will focus, I guess, primarily on the Gospel reading from Mark 3, but really, we're going to mention all three of them. It's printed out in the worship folder if you'd like to follow along. But I want to start with agree or disagree. Now, I know I've taught you, you're supposed to always both agree and disagree, but today, you have to pick a side, all right? So, do you agree or disagree with this statement? St. Paul's is family. Well, that's nice of you to say. You know, when I first came here 10 years ago, I I saw this phrase. I don't know if it was Pastor Albrecht or Pastor Kovac or someone before, or or maybe it was one of you, but but I heard that St. Paul's is a family of faith. And I was excited, and I I, I latched onto that term because when I came here, it was 14 years of ministry, and it had been all about teenagers. I taught high school for 10 years, and then I went to a church for—I'm sorry, I taught high school for two years— And then I went to a church for 10 years that had more teenagers or high school students in it than the high school I had previously taught at. And then I left there and went and taught high school for two more years. It was all teenagers. And and here's what I found out. It's almost too late. It's a little bit like basketball. I I, I coach basketball too. And when kids would come to me in middle school or high school, it it just, it drove me nuts. Their form is terrible. Like you got to get your elbow in, you got to get everything lined up, shoot at the top of your jump, all, all these things. But it was the same problem. They had been shooting for so long that their habits were formed and it was almost impossible to correct them. And I, I, I started to feel the same way about ministry to teenagers. It's not that it was hopeless. It's not that it was useless or ineffective. It's just the habits were formed. And I I was ineffective, I often felt, because I had so little time and really so little influence. Because those kids, as often as I tried to spend time with them, they always went back home. So my philosophy of ministry began to change. I I love working with high school kids. I I still do, even as I'm getting older. But I realized that really, it's all about the family. Which is kind of what we talked about last week, that God created male and female, united them together in marriage, and then told them to be fruitful and fill the earth. And because sin had broken the world and the family, God now wants to fill heaven. And that begins with parents passing on the faith to their children at home. But the family, mom, dad, and kids, it's not isolated. And so the congregation has the opportunity to become extended family. But I have to tell you about April. When I got to my church in Appleton, first time, I mean, I taught high school for two years, but I'd never been a pastor at a church before. And I was the teen guy, the youth guy. And one of my jobs was to get all of the contact information for the college students. Now, this was 2002, so cell phones really weren't popular yet. So you're looking for a new address because you change dorms every year. You're looking for a phone number. Any way we can be in contact. And so I sent all this information out, and April had not responded. And then one day, I don't remember why, she walked into the office Oh, hi, I'm Pastor Berger. What's your name? I'm April. Oh, I've been looking for you. Why? Well, I'm, I'm trying to get your contact information. You go to UW-Madison, right? Yeah. So, well, I, I'm, I like your phone number and your, your email address, your, your regular postal address. Why? So, well, we're your church family. We want to stay in contact with you. She said church family. I've heard that my entire life, that church is family. And never once have I felt like anybody at this church treats me like family. <laughs> Well, I'm just the new guy. <laughs> Sorry. So if you feel like St. Paul's is family, I'm glad to hear it. Does everybody? And what exactly does that mean? I mean, it sounds great. St. Paul's is family. It's even our website, stpaulsfamily.com. But what does that mean? What does that look like? That, that's what I want to study with you today as we look at God's Word. I want to start with the Gospel reading, which reminds us that Jesus was born into a family. We know his mother was Mary. Now, remember, it was uh, maybe not a traditional family because Jesus' father was his stepfather, Joseph. And there's this discussion out there of whether or not Jesus had siblings. 
Now, the Roman, church, the Roman Catholic Church, they, they want to keep Mary as a perpetual virgin. And I really don't understand why, because the Bible doesn't say that, nor is it necessary for salvation. In my mind, I, I wonder why wouldn't Mary and Joseph have more children? And in fact, the Bible makes a couple of mentions of Jesus' brothers and sisters. One we heard about a month ago when Jesus went home to preach in Nazareth after he had begun his public ministry. They rejected him because he was little Jesus, I think I said at that time. They knew, they said, his father. They knew his mother. They knew his brothers and sisters. And they even named four of his brothers. I don't know if I'll get the names right. I think it was James, Joses, or Joseph, Judas, and Simon. In our reading today, we find out that Jesus' mother and brothers, now Joseph was gone. I don't know, maybe there weren't any sisters. I'm not sure. But his family had come to get him. It's hard to say why. We fully expect that Mary and Joseph were believers because the angel came to them and told them that Mary was, what was in her was conceived by the Holy Spirit and, and told Joseph to, it was okay to go ahead and marry her. So, so they knew. But all indications point to the fact that Jesus' siblings were not believers, at least not right away. And that kind of makes sense because they just knew Jesus as their big brother. In my mind, like, yeah, but Jesus was perfect. Yeah, he was, but I, I'm not sure that stood out to them as, as much as we might expect. And, and so when Jesus began preaching and teaching and doing miracles and people began to wonder out loud, is this the Messiah? Is he the Son of God? And when Jesus at first didn't refute that and then later actually accepted the titles, they thought he was nuts. And so they came to take him away from the crowd, which I, I think is why Jesus made the statement he did. Jesus, your mother, your brothers, they're outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers and my sisters? And then Jesus looked at the people who were listening to him, and he obviously could see and read their hearts too. Whoever does God's will, whoever believes in me, they are my family. You could also argue that the entire nation of Israel was like an extended family. Biologically, they were all related as descendants of Abraham. And then Abraham's son was Isaac. Isaac's son was Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. They literally became the 12 tribes of Israel. And if at the time you met an Israelite, they would tell you their father's name, like Jesus, the son of Joseph. And then they would tell you their tribe from the tribe of Judah. Or uh, we're going to read this in our, our Bible study today. We're going to learn about Ehud, uh, one of the first judges. And we find out that he's the son of Gera, a Benjamite. That's how they related to each other, their, their clans, their tribes. More than that, they were bound together by these laws, the laws of Moses. And that's why we read Deuteronomy 31 earlier. Those laws made them unique. They had the Sabbath day, that was unique. They had their own holidays or festivals. They had all of these laws about what they could eat or not eat. It, it made them different than all the rest of the nations. And that, that difference or that uniqueness bound them together along with all of their experience, their troubles and trials throughout the years, like slavery in Egypt and then the Assyrian captivity and then the Babylonian captivity. All these things bound them together. And, and so there's this family they're the chosen people. They're the ones who are supposed to believe in the one true God and his promised Messiah. But what happened when Jesus came? Those who should have believed the most rejected him the most. Not all of them. Now, throughout the Old Testament, there were always unbelievers. It's just always the case. When we began our study of Judges last week, we heard that an entire generation grew up who did not know the Lord or what he had done for them because the parents and the nation as a whole had not passed faith on as Moses prescribed. He's, I'm actually a little surprised. Every seven years, they're supposed to read the whole law. Well, in reality, every week on the Sabbath, they were supposed to go to the temple or go to the synagogue and, and do what we do, learn God's word. And that hadn't happened. It's lost so quickly. And so within the nation, you, you have unbelievers all the way back to Abraham and, and as soon as it began to grow. When Jesus comes, you have a different kind of unbeliever. 
You have people who believe in the one true God, who have been following God's law and looking for the Messiah, but when Jesus comes, they reject him as that Messiah including many of the religious leaders, part of that was because they couldn't get over Jesus as human and God. Part of it was because in their hearts, they believed that salvation came by keeping the law. And so Jesus had to teach them that salvation comes by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. He had to continually, by his teaching and preaching, by his miracles, try to convince them that he was indeed, is indeed, the Son of God and the Christ, the Messiah. He also had to teach them that salvation wasn't just for the nation of Israel. That he came also for Gentiles or non-Jews. Now, yes, God had chosen the nation of Israel for a very specific purpose. He had set them aside because he was planning to fulfill his promise of a a Messiah or a Savior to come through them. But once Jesus came, there was no longer a need for all of those Old Testament laws of Moses. Now, salvation came through Christ and it was for all. And so after Jesus ascended and Pentecost came, what happened? Congregations began to form, both Jews and Gentiles, brand new families. You know why that was so so important in the early Christian church? It's because at the time, Christianity was still unpopular. For the longest time, it was illegal, and, and it split families because some believed and some didn't. And when some believed, those who didn't often, they said, you're out. They forsook them. They're not not part of the family anymore. Uh, Now, we're not really used to that, I don't think. Maybe you are, but I don't hear that very often in America. We we all have families where some believe and some don't, and we just agree not to talk about religion at Thanksgiving and Christmas. But in other parts of the world, if you believe in Jesus, you're no longer part of the family. I don't have a lot of examples, but I've heard about students at Fox Valley Lutheran High School who come from China, an atheist, communist country, and, and if they learn about Jesus and they get baptized and they become a Christian, I, I, I mean, I've heard them say, my family has disowned me. I think that happens throughout the world more often than we realize. And so, what do they do? Well, they formed a new family. They weren't trying to exclude the biological family, and ideally, the biological family and the church family would be the same, but that just wasn't always the case. Which is why Paul, when he wrote Timothy, a pastor at one of those early churches, he he said, Timothy, when you look at the members, see them as family. He said, don't be harsh with the old guys. Treat them as your elders. Treat the older women as your mothers. The the younger men as your brothers and the younger women as your sisters, keeping them pure. And that's not just for the pastor, isn't it? For all of us. To have a family that loves us and supports us and encourages us, not just in life, like you write in the yearbook, oh, we've been through all the ups and downs, but in faith and in godly living. In fact, I think I could argue with you, because I like arguing, but I could argue with you that your bond with fellow believers is stronger than a family bond. It might not feel that way. And again, ideally, it would be the same. I, I, I pray that everyone in my biological family would also be a believer. That, that's just not the case. And where it's not, there's a stronger bond with believers because we're going to spend eternity with each other And that's not always the case with family members. And that brings us back to St. Paul's. Is St. Paul's a family? I always forget the exact year. I think this congregation has been around like 138 is my guess. Carla will look it up on Monday for me so I know. It's a long time. And we're in a small community. So guess what that means? There's generations of families here. I'm looking around, looking for some of them. Second service, the Bames will be right there. I know, there, I know Mike's here. Uh, there, there's, there, there you go, right there. There's Bames everywhere, right? Because Grandpa Bame had kids and they had kids. There's generations of Bames. I know Lee Volp, I think, is up there with his daughter. There's Volps everywhere. There, there's, there's generations. 
that, that partly makes us family, but not all of every family is here. And sometimes that doesn't mean they're unbelievers. Sometimes they just live somewhere else. But then there are families here who were not born and raised at St. Paul's or in Winnicott, who didn't send their kids to Winnicott or Amro school districts, who might have just moved in. In fact, there's people constantly moving into the highlands. They tend to be widows. And they walk into the church, and they don't have any family members within driving distance. We are all they have. But even if you do have biological family, wouldn't it be great to have a whole other group of people that you see regularly sitting in the pews around you or sitting in, in chairs in family impressions or Bible study or catechism class or, or showing up on Wednesday nights for the meal before Advent or Lent or, or, or coming all throughout the year. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be nice to have somebody who just loves you like, like your family? Carol Beiser is not here today. She usually sits, well, the Ryans, I think you're in her, her pew. No, I'm just kidding. She fell down. She, she broke her hip. She had surgery. She's going to be okay. But she said, can, can you tell the Wagners? And her grandson said, don't worry, Grandma. I, I already called them. Because John and Pam Wagner have been sitting in the, they're not here today either, but I'm calling out all these people that aren't at church today. No, no, no guilt. <laughs> they've been sitting in front of her since they've come here, and they used to be neighbors on the farm. And and so they got to be family. And Holman's, I think you're part of that. And Ellis is, you're part of that. And Bannock's, you're part of that. And Daly's, you're part of that. Because you guys all sit in the same place every week. And you've actually started to talk to each other. And so now when someone's missing, people say, well, what happened to them? I, I, can I send them a card? Can I give them a call? That's family. How can we continue to build on that? You know, a lot of people, because when I came, I had this idea of family already in my head. Then I heard this phrase, family of faith. I was so excited to start family impressions. And people said, oh, wow, we've never done it that way. Why are you doing that? I'll, let me tell you why. Part of it was because parents and kids need to learn how to read and discuss God's word together so that when they go home, it continues. And it's not just an event at church. That's happening for those who come. I was really excited last week because this has happens once or twice a year when Pastor Albrecht was gone, but now he's gone and, and Pastor Warnicke's not here. So we're having Bible study all together. This was always my secondary purpose for family impressions. Family, it's generations. And I thought it would be great, you know, if, if there's a family and grandpa and grandpa are members here, they, and this happens, like, well, like Mike coming or Grandpa Bame coming and sitting with the Bames. There's three generations sometimes sitting at one table studying God's word together. That's awesome. But not everybody has their family here. So what if there is just an older person or couple sitting with a young family with little kids and they become kind of like grandma and grandpa? You know, that's happened. I did a wedding here a couple of weeks ago for Amanda Stone and Jordan Olson, both members of the church. And I was, I was a little surprised when I got to the reception and there was Mary Benach. She had also been at a high school graduation for a family that moved away from our church to Wapaka, what, five or six years ago. Why was she there? It's because she came to Family Impressions. It's because she sat at a table with people she didn't really know and got to know them. It's because they're family. That's what I want for you. I, I want you to come to Family Impressions so that all the little kids who are down there running around and maybe sometimes crying or making noise, that, that they not only have mom and dad at home and maybe fellow believers in their biological family, but, but they've got a congregation that also calls them family. I would love to keep in touch with every college student. And when we put the cards out here a couple of weeks ago, there's really not that many right now. And, and every high school student and, and, and all the kids, I can't, there's too many. I can barely keep up with my own kids. And, and I try to keep Andrew in line. But you can. You don't have to know all of them. You just not, might know a couple of them. And it's not just the kids. I, I didn't say this last night because Mary was here and I don't want uh, to embarrass her, but when we started life groups a couple of years ago, I think Mary did her first group last year. I said, Mary, would you be willing to lead a group for women? You know who most of the women go to her group? Not all of them. They're widows. Mary's a widow. They were lonely. 
They just wanted somebody to talk to. And the fact that they get to meet around God's word, one of those widows is Barb Eckstein. She can't go to the group. So Mary calls her every week, even when we don't have life groups. Can you know somebody? Can you become a grandma or grandpa, an aunt or an uncle, a brother or sister? You have to decide if St. Paul's is family or not. But here's my prayer, is that St. Paul's will be family. Because then we not only get to encourage one another every week in worship and Bible study and daily life, we get to spend eternity with each other. Now that's a good place to say amen, but I have one more thought. I think there's other people looking for family too. And even if they come here and they think, oh, kind of traditional, pastor wears a robe, really loud, obnoxious, talks too long, there's all these things. Maybe, maybe, maybe this isn't what I'm really looking for, but you pay attention to them. And, and as I encouraged you last week, you say, hi, my name is, and they tell you their name. And you say, we're glad you're here. I hope I see you again. I think they might come back. And that not only can be St. Paul's, can be family for those who are already here, but for those who might still come. Now I'll say amen. Let's stand.